The Land Back Movement is a contemporary indigenous-led initiative aimed at reclaiming ancestral lands that have been taken over or exploited by colonial and governmental entities. It seeks to restore indigenous control over territories to preserve cultural heritage, protect natural resources, and assert sovereignty. Although the movement has gained significant traction in recent years, its roots can be traced back to a long history of indigenous resistance to land dispossession, reflecting a broad struggle for indigenous rights and self-determination. The land back movement is deeply rooted in the history of colonization and the dispossession of indigenous lands in North America and beyond. When European settlers arrived, they often viewed land as a resource to be owned and exploited, conflicting with indigenous perspectives that often saw land as a shared entity with spiritual significance. Treaties were frequently made and broken, leading to widespread displacement of indigenous communities. The Dawes Act of 1887 in the United States, for example, sought to assimilate Native Americans into American society by dividing communal lands into individual plots, drastically reducing the land held by indigenous peoples. This era marked a significant loss of indigenous land, culture, and autonomy, setting the stage for ongoing resistance. 20th century saw an organized indigenous resistance movement. The American Indian Movement, AIM, founded in 1968, played a crucial role in advocating for native rights, including land reclamation. The occupation of Alcatraz Island by native activists from 1969 to 1971 was a pivotal moment in the struggle for land rights. The activists claimed the island under the Treaty of Fort Laramie, which had promised the return of abandoned federal lands to indigenous peoples. This act of reclamation brought national attention to the issue and inspired similar movements across the continent. Ames' activism laid the groundwork for future land back efforts by highlighting the connection between land sovereignty and cultural survival. The latter half of the 20th century saw significant legal and political advances for indigenous land rights. Landmark court cases like the 1974 Bolt decision recognized Native American fishing rights in Washington state, reinforcing treaty rights and setting a precedent for land claims. The 1980 settlement between the U.S. government and the Passamaquoddy and Penobscot tribes in Maine returned millions of acres to the tribes. In Canada, the 1990 Oka crisis, a standoff between the Mohawk people and the Canadian government over a proposed golf course on sacred land, highlighted the urgent need for addressing indigenous land claims. These events emphasized the importance of legal frameworks in advancing indigenous land rights and provided momentum for the land back movement. The term land back gained prominence in the early 21st century as indigenous activists began to use it to encapsulate a broader vision of reclamation and decolonization. The Idle No More movement, which began in Canada in 2012, played a significant role in this resurgence by advocating for indigenous sovereignty and environmental protection. The movement emphasized the interconnectedness of land rights and environmental justice, as many indigenous lands face threats from resource extraction and climate change. Social media platforms have further amplified the movement, allowing indigenous voices to reach global audiences and galvanizing support for land back initiatives worldwide. In recent years, the land back movement has achieved several notable successes. In 2020, the Esalen tribe of California regained over 1,200 acres of ancestral land in a historic victory. Similarly, in Canada, the federal government returned thousands of acres to the Siksika Nation in Alberta, addressing long-standing grievances. These successes are often the result of persistent advocacy, legal battles, and negotiation. The movement has also influenced policy changes, with some governments beginning to recognize the importance of returning land to indigenous peoples as a means of reconciliation. These victories demonstrate the movement's growing influence and its potential to reshape relationships between indigenous peoples and settler governments. The land back movement is not just about returning land. It's about restoring indigenous governance, culture, and identity. It challenges existing power structures and calls for a reevaluation of land ownership and stewardship. By advocating for land return, the movement seeks to address historical injustices and promote a more equitable and sustainable future. The movement's emphasis on environmental stewardship aligns with broader global efforts to combat climate change, highlighting the role of indigenous knowledge in sustainable land management. 
As the movement continues to grow, it presents an opportunity for meaningful reconciliation and partnership between indigenous and non-indigenous communities. The future of the land bag movement lies in its ability to inspire systemic change and foster a deeper understanding of the vital connection between land and identity. Taking land back from non-Indigenous people and returning it to Indigenous people involves complex legal, political, and social processes. Here's a breakdown of how the land back movement approaches the issue, along with some methods and strategies. First off, legal claims and litigation. Many Indigenous groups have historical treaties with governments that have been ignored or violated. Enforcing these treaties through legal action can lead to land restitution or compensation. For example, indigenous nations may file lawsuits to reclaim lands guaranteed by treaties that were never honored. Land claims agreements uh, settle indigenous land claims. They often involve lengthy negotiations between indigenous groups and governments. Successful agreements can result in the return of land, financial compensation, and increased self-governance. An example is the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement in Canada, which returned land to the Cree and Inuit peoples. Courts can play a pivotal role in recognizing indigenous land rights. Landmark cases like the Mabo case in Australia have overturned the doctrine of te terra nullius, land belonging to no one, and recognized native title rights. There's also negotiation in government policy. Some governments have policies aimed at reconciliation with indigenous peoples, which include returning land. This can be part of a broader reconciliation, such, uh, such as Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which includes recommendations for land return. Indigenous groups often engage in negotiations with federal or state governments to reach settlements that include land return. These negotiations can be complex and involve various stakeholders, including private landowners, industry, and environmental groups. Governments can acknowledge the sovereignty of indigenous nations and work with them to transfer land back. This recognition can lead to partnerships where land is co-managed or returned outright. There's also direct action and advocacy. Indigenous activists may occupy lands to draw attention to their claims and push for negotiations. Occupations like the 1970 occupation of Alcatraz Island have historically been used to highlight land injustices and galvanize public support. Raising awareness about land rights and historical injustices can build public support for the land back movement. Social media and public demonstrations are powerful tools for mobilizing allies and putting pressure on governments and corporations. The land back movement often aligns with environmental groups, emphasizing that indigenous land stewardship is crucial for ecological preservation. This partnership can create broader coalitions advocating for land return. There's also community-led initiatives. Indigenous communities can establish land trusts to acquire and manage land. These trusts work to purchase land on the open market or receive donations, ensuring it's protected and used according to indigenous values and practices. Once land is returned, indigenous communities focus on sustainable development and cultural revitalization. This could include establishing cultural centers, developing eco-friendly housing, and promoting traditional land use practices. By forming partnerships with businesses or leveraging financial resources from settlements, indigenous communities can develop economic projects that align with their cultural and environmental goals. Some corporations recognize their role in historical land dispossession and have voluntarily returned land to indigenous groups. This often requires pressure from public advocacy and demonstrates corporate responsibility. Businesses can form partnerships with indigenous groups to manage land in ways that benefit both parties. This includes joint ventures that respect indigenous rights and prioritize sustainable development. Governments can create incentives for private landowners to sell or donate land back to indigenous communities. Tax breaks or other financial incentives can encourage this practice. The process of taking land back is multifaceted and often requires collaboration between indigenous communities, governments, the private sector, and civil society. Each situation is unique, with strategies tailored to the specific historical, legal, and social context of the land in question. Ultimately, the success of land back depends on recognizing the sovereignty of indigenous peoples and respecting their rights to land and self-determination. Thank you for listening.